Reporting in progress. Mm. Antigone, Act yes. One, an English version by Dudley Fitz and Robert Fitzgerald. Before the palace of Creon, king of Thebes, a central double door and two lateral doors, a platform extends the length of the facade and from this platform, three steps lead down into the orchestra or chorus ground. Time, dawn of the day after the repulse of the Argive army from the assault on Thebes. Antigone and Ismene enter from the central door of the palace. Ismene, dear sister, you would think that we had already suffered enough for the curse on Oedipus. I cannot imagine any grief that you and I have not gone through. And now, have they told you of the new decree of our King Creon? I have heard nothing. I know that two sisters lost two brothers, a double death in a single hour. And I know that the Argive army fled in the night, but beyond this, nothing. I thought so. And that is why I wanted you to come out here with me. There is something we must do. Why do you speak so strangely? Listen, Ismene. Creon buried our brother Ateocles with military honors, gave him a soldier's funeral, and it was right that he should. But Polynesus, they fought us, they fought as bravely and died as miserably. They say that Creon has sworn no one shall bury him, no one mourn for him, but his body must lie in the fields, a sweet treasure for carrion birds to find as they search for food. That is what they say, and our good Creon is coming here to announce it publicly, and the penalty, stoning to death in the public square. There it is. And now you can prove what you are, a true sister or a traitor to your family. Antigone, you are mad. What can I possibly do? You must decide whether you will help me or not. I do not understand you. Help you in what? Ismene, I'm going to bury him. Will you come? Bury him? You've just said the new law forbids it. He is my brother, and he is your brother too. But think of the danger. Think what Creon will do. Creon is not enough to stand in my way. Oh, sister. Oedipus died, everyone hating him for what his own search brought to light, his eyes ripped out by his own hand, and Jocasta died, his mother and wife at once. She twisted the cords that strangled her life, and our two brothers died, each killed by the other's sword. And we are left, but, oh, Antigone, Think how much more terrible than these our own death would be if we should go against Creon and do what he has forbidden. We are only women. We cannot fight with men, Antigone. The law is strong. We must give in to the law in this thing and in worse. I beg the dead to forgive me, but I am helpless. I must yield to those in authority. And I think it is dangerous business to be always meddling. If that is what you think, I should not want you, even if you asked to come. You have made your choice. You can be what you want to be. But I will bury him. And if I must die, I say that this crime is holy. I shall lie down with him in death. And I shall be as dear to him as he to me. It is the dead, not the living, who make the longest demands. We die forever. You may do as you like, since apparently the laws of the God mean nothing to you. Well, they mean a great deal to me. But I have no strength to break laws that were made for the public good. That must be your excuse, I suppose. But as for me, I will bury the brother I love. Oh, Antigone, I am so afraid for you. You need not be. 
You have yourself to consider after all. But no one must hear of this. You must tell no one. I will keep it a secret, I promise. Oh, tell it, tell everyone. Think how they'll hate you when it all comes out if they learn that you knew about it all, all the time. Oh, so fiery. You should be cold with fear. Perhaps, but I am only doing what I must. But can you do it? I say that you cannot. Very well, when my strength gives out, I shall do no more. Impossible things should not be tried at all. Go away, Ismene. I shall be hating you soon, and the dead will too, for your words are hateful. Leave me my foolish plan. I am not afraid of the danger. If it means death, it will not be the worst of deaths, death without honor. Go then, if you feel that you must. You are unwise, but a loyal friend indeed to those who love you. Exit into the palace. Antigone goes off. Enter the chorus. Now the long blade of the sun, lying level east to west, touches with glory Thebes of the seven gates. Open, unlidded eye of golden day, O oh, marching light across the eddy and rush of Dirce's stream, striking the white shields of the enemy, thrown headlong backward from the blaze of morning. Panaises, their commander, roused with them the windy phrases. He is the wild eagle screaming insults above our land. His wings, their shields of snow, his crest, their marshaled ends. Against, Again? Out. oh, sorry. Oh, no, you go ahead. I thought you said I was. Yeah, it's confusing because it says chorus, there's but it also says anti There's another arms. part that just says chorus, Cliff, that, that's yeah. not strophe or anti strophe. Right. So go ahead, Betty. We'll cut that bit out. Against our seven gates in a yawning ring, the famished spears came onward in the night. But before his jaws were sated with our blood, or pine fire took the garland of our towers, he was thrown back, and as he turned, great thieves, no tender victim for his noisy power, rose like a dragon behind him, shouting war. For God hates utterly the bray of bragging tongues, and when he beheld their smiling, their swagger of golden helms, the frown of his thunder blasted, their first man from our walls. We heard his shout of triumph, high in the air turned to a scream. Far out in a flaming arc he fell with his windy torch, and the earth struck him, and others stemming in st storming in fury no less than his, found shock of death in the dusty joy of battle. Seven captains at seven gates yielded their clanging arms to the god that bends the battle line and breaks it. These two only, brothers in blood, face to face in matchless rage, mirroring each the other's death, clashed in long combat. But now in the beautiful morning of victory, let Thebes of the many chariots sing for joy. With hearts for dancing, we'll take leave of war. Our temples shall be sweet with hymns of praise and the long night shall echo with our chorus. But now at last, our new king is coming. Creon of Thebes, Menachius son. In this auspicious dawn of his reign, what are the new complexities that shifting fate has woven for him? What is his counsel? Why has he summoned the old men to hear him? Enter Creon from the palace. Creon, he addresses the chorus from the top step. Gentlemen, I have the honor to inform you that our ship of state, which recent storms have threatened to destroy, has come safely to harbour at last, guided by the merciful wisdom of heaven. I have summoned you here this morning because I know 
that I can depend on you. Your devotion to King Laos was absolute. You never hesitated in your duty to our late ruler Oedipus, and when Oedipus died, your loyalty was transferred to his children. Unfortunately, as you know, his two sons, the princes Etiocles and Polynices, have killed each other in battle, and I, as the next in blood, have succeeded to the full power of the throne. I am aware, of course, that no ruler can expect complete loyalty from his subjects until he has been tested in office. Nevertheless, I say to you at the very outset that I have nothing but contempt for the kind of governor who is afraid, for whatever reason, to follow the course that he knows is best for the state. And as for the man who sets private friendship above the public welfare, I have no use for him either. I call God to witness. But if I saw my country headed for ruin, I should not be afraid to speak out plainly. And I need hardly remind you that I would never have any dealings with an enemy of the people. No one values friendship more highly than I. But we must remember that friends are made at the risk of wrecking our ship and not real friends at all. These are my principles at any rate, and that is why I have made the following decision concerning the sons of Oedipus. Eteocles, who died as a man should die, fighting for his country, is to be buried with full military honours, with all the ceremony that is usual when the greatest heroes die. But his brother, Polynices, who broke his exile to come back with fire and sword against his native city and the shrines of his father's god, whose one idea was to spill the blood of his blood and sell his people into slavery, Polynices, I say, is to have no burial. No man is to touch him or say the least prayer for him. He shall lie on the plain unburied, and the birds and the scavenging dogs can do with him whatever they like. That is my command, and you can see the wisdom behind it. <clears throat> as long as I am king, no traitor is going to be honoured with the royal man, loyal man, but whoever shows by word and deed that he is on the side of the state, he shall have my respect while he is living, and my reverence when he is dead. If that is your will, Creon, son of my kindness, you have the right to enforce it. We are yours. That is my will. Take care that you do your part. We are old men. Let the younger ones carry it out. I do not mean that. The sentries have been appointed. Then what is it that you would have us do? You will give no support to whoever breaks this law. Only a crazy man is in love with death. Ah, death it is. Yet money talks. And the wisest have sometimes been known to count a few coins too many. Oh. I, I, I'll not say that I'm out of breath from running, King, because every time I stopped to think about what I have to tell you, I felt like going back. And all the time, a voice kept saying, uh, you, you fool, you don't know you're walking straight into trouble. And then another voice, yes, but if you let somebody else get the news to Creon first, it will be even worse than that for you. Uh, but good sense won out. At least I, I, I hope it was good sense. And here I am with a story that makes no sense at all. <laughs> but I'll tell it anyhow, because as they say, what's going to happen is going to happen. And uh, Oh, come to the point. What have you to say? I did not do it. I did not see who did it. You must not punish me for what someone else has done. Oh, a comprehensive defense. <laughs> More effective, perhaps, 
if I knew its purpose. Come, what is it? A dreadful thing. I, I, I don't know how to put it. Out with it. Well then, the dead man, Polynesus. Um, the sentry is overcome, fumbles for words. Creon waits impassively. Out there. Uh, someone. Uh, new dust on, on the slimy flesh. Someone has given it burial that way and gone. Long pause. Creon finally speaks with deadly control. And the man who dared to do this? I swear I do not know. You must believe me. Listen, the ground was dry. Not a sign of digging. No, not a wheel track in the dust. No trace of anyone. It was when they relieved us this morning and one of them, the corporal, pointed to it. There it was. The strangest Look, the, the body just mounded over with light dust. You see, not, not buried really, but as if they covered it just enough for the ghost's peace and no sign of dogs or any wild animal that had been there. And then what a scene there was, every man of us accusing the other. We all proved the other man did it. We all had proof that we could not have done it. We were ready to take hot iron in our hands, walk through fire, swear by all the gods, it was not I. I do not know who it was, but it was not I. Creon's rage has been mounting steadily, but the sentry is too intent upon his story to notice it. And then when this came to nothing, someone said a thing that silenced us and made us stare down at the ground. You had to be told the news and one of us had to do it. We threw the dice and the bad luck fell to me. So here I am, no happier to be here than you are to have me. Uh, nobody likes the man who brings bad news. I have been wondering, King, can it be that the gods have done this? Stop! Must you doddering wrecks go out of your heads entirely? The gods? Intolerable! The gods favour this corpse? Why? How had he served them? Tried to loot their temples, burn their images, yes. And the whole state with its laws with it. Is this your senile opinion that the gods love to honour bad men? <laughs> A pious thought. No. From the very, every beginning there have been those who have whispered together, stiff-necked anarchists putting their heads together, scheming against me in alleys. These are the men, and they have bribed my own guard to do this thing. Money! There's nothing in the world so demoralizing as money. Find that man, bring him here to me, or your death will be the least of your problems. I'll string you up alive, and there will be certain ways to make you discover your employer before you die. And the process may teach you a lesson you seem to have missed. Dearest prophet is sometimes too dear. That depends on the source. Do you understand me? A fortune won is often misfortune. King, may I speak? Your very voice distresses me. Are you sure that it is my voice and not your conscience? Oh my God, he wants to analyze me now. It is not what I say, but what has been done that hurts you. You talk too much. Maybe, but I've done nothing. Sold your soul for some silver. That's all you've done. 
how dreadful it is when the right judge judges wrong. Oh, your figures of speech may entertain you now, but unless you bring me the man, you will get little profit from them in the end. Enter Creon into the palace. Bring me the man? I'd like nothing better than bringing him the man. But bring him or not, you have seen the last of me here. At any rate, oh, I'm safe. Exit sentry. Numberless are the world's wonders, but none more wonderful than man. The strong ray sea yields to his prow, the storm, the storm gray sea yields to his prows, the huge crests bear him high. Earth, holy and inexhaustible, is graven with shining furrows where his plows have gone year after year. The timeless labor of stallions. The light-boned birds and beasts that cling to cover, the lithe fish lighting their reaches of dim water, all are taken, tamed in the net of his mind. The lion on the hill, the wild horse windy-maned, resigned to him, and his blunt yoke has broken the sultry shoulders of the mountain bull. Words also, and thought as rapid as air, he fashions it to his good use. Statecraft is his, and his the skill that deflect the arrows of snow, the spears of winter rain. From every wind he has made himself secure, from all but one. In the late wind of death, he cannot stand. O oh, clear intelligence, force beyond all measure. O oh, fate of man, working both good and evil. When the laws are kept, how proudly his city stands. When the laws are broken, what of his city then? Never may the anarchic man find rest at my hearth. Never be it said that my thoughts are his thoughts. Re-enter sentry leading Antigone. What does this mean? Surely this captive woman is the princess, Antigone. Why should she be taken? Here is the one who did it. We caught her in the very act of burying him. Where's Creon? Just coming from the house, enter Creon. Oh, what has happened? Why have you come back so soon? Oh, King, a man should never be too sure of anything. I would have sworn that you'd not see me here again. Your anger frightened me so, and the things you threatened me with. Oh, but how could I tell them then that I'd be able to solve the case so soon? No dice throwing this time. I was only too glad to come. Here is this woman. She is the guilty one. We found her trying to bury him. Take her, then question her, judge her as you will. I am through with the whole thing now and glad of it. But this, this is Antigone. Why have you brought her here? She was burying him, I tell you. Is this the truth? I saw her with my own eyes. Can I say more? The details, come. Tell me quickly. It was like this. After those terrible threats of yours, King, we went back and brushed the dust away from the body. The flesh was soft now and stinking. So we sat on a hill to windward and kept guard. No napping happened until the white round sun whirled in the center of the round sky over us. Then suddenly a storm of dust roared up from the earth and the sky went out. The plain vanished with all its trees in the, in the stinging dark. We closed our eyes and endured it. The whirlwind lasted a long time, but it passed. And then we looked and there was Antigone. I have seen a mother bird come to a strict nest heard her crying bitterly a broken note or two for the young one stolen. Just so, when this girl found the bare corpse, 
and all her love's work wasted. She wept and cried on heaven to damn the hands that had done this thing. And then she brought more dust and sprinkled wine three times for her brother's ghost. We ran and took her at once. She was not afraid. Not even when we charged her with what she had done. She denied nothing. And this was a comfort to me and some uneasiness. For it is a good thing to escape from death, but it is no great pleasure to bring death to a friend. Yet I always say, there's nothing so comfortable as your own safe skin. <laughs> and you, Antigone, you with your head hanging, do you confess this thing? I do. I deny nothing. You may go. Exit sentry to Antigone. Tell me, tell me briefly, had you heard my proclamation touching on this matter? It was public. Could I help hearing it? And yet, you dared defy the law. I dared. It was not God's proclamation. That final justice that rules the world below makes no such laws. Your edict, King, was strong, but all your strength is weakness itself against the immortal, unrecorded laws of God. They are not merely now. They were and shall be operative forever, beyond man utterly. I knew I must die, even without your decree. I'm only mortal. And if I must die now before it is my time to die, surely this is no hardship. Can anyone living as I live with evil all about me think death less, of, less than a friend? This death of mine is of no importance. But if I left my brother lying in death unburied, I should have suffered. Now I do not. You smile at me. Ah, Creon, think me a fool if you like, but it may well be that a fool convicts me of folly. Like father, like daughter, both headstrong, deaf to reason. She has never learned to yield. She has so much to learn. The inflexible heart breaks first, the toughest iron cracks first, and the wildest horses bend their necks at the pull of a smallest curb. Pride in a slave? This girl is a as guilty as of a double insolence, breaking the given laws and boasting of it. Who is the man here, she or I, if this crime goes unpunished? Sister's child or more than sister's child, or closer yet in blood, she and her sister win bitter death for this. Go, some of you. Arrest Ismene. I accuse you, I accuse her equally. Bring her. You will find her sniffling in the house there. Her mind's a traitor. Crimes kept in the dark cry for light. And the guardian brain shudders. But now much worse than this is brazen boasting of barefaced anarchy. Creon, what more do you want than my death? Nothing. That gives me everything. Then I beg you, kill me. This talking is a great weariness. Your words are distasteful to me, and I am sure that mine seem so to you. And yet they should not seem so. I should have praise and honor for what I have done. All these men here would praise me were their lips not frozen shut with fear of you. Ah, the good fortune of kings, licensed to say and do whatever they please. You are alone here in that opinion? No, they are with me, but they keep their tongues in leash. Maybe, but you are guilty and they are not. There is no guilt in reverence for the dead. 
But Ediocles, was he not your brother too? My brother too. And you insult his memory? The dead man would not say that I insult it. He would, for you honour a traitor as much as him. His own brother, traitor or not, and equal in blood. He made war on his country. Etiocles defended it. Nevertheless, there are honours due all the dead. But not the same for the wicked as for the just. Creon, Creon, which of us can say what the gods hold wicked? An enemy is an enemy, even dead. It is my nature to join in love, not hate. Oh, go join them then. If you must have your love, find it in hell. But see, Ismene comes. Enter Ismene. Those tears are sisterly. The cloud that shadows her eyes rains down gentle sorrow. You too, Ismene. Snake in my ordered house, sucking my blood stealthily. And all the time I never knew that these two sisters were aiming at my throat. Ismene, do you confess your share in this crime or deny it? Answer me. Yes, if she will let me say so, I am guilty. No, Ismene, you have no right to say so. You would not help me, and I would not have you help me. But now I know what you meant, and I am here to join you to take my share of punishment. The dead man and the gods who rule the dead know whose act this was. Words are not friends. Do you refuse me, Antigone? I want to die with you. I too have a duty that I must discharge to the dead. You shall not lessen my death by sharing it. What do I care for life when you are dead? Ask Creon. You're always hanging on his opinions. You are laughing at me. Why, Antigone? It's a joyless laughter, Ismene. But can I do nothing? Yes, save yourself. I shall not envy you. There are those who will praise you. I shall have honor too. But we are equally guilty. No more, Ismene. You are alive, but I belong to death. Gentlemen, I beg you to observe these girls. One has just now lost her mind. The other, it seems, never had a mind at all. Grief teaches the steadiest minds to waver, King. Yours certainly did when you assumed guilt with the guilty. But how could I go on living without her? You are. She is already dead. But your own son's bride? Ah, there are places enough for him to push his plough. I want no wicked women for my sons. Oh, dearest Hymon, how are your father wrong you? I've had enough of your childish talk of marriage. Do you really intend to steal this girl from your son? No, death will do that for me. Then she must die? Oh, you dazzle me. But enough of this talk. You, there, take them away and guard them well. For they are but women. And even brave men run when they see death coming. Exeunt Ismene, Antigone, and guards. Fortunate is the man who has never tasted God's vengeance. Where once the anger of heaven has struck, that house is shaken forever. Damnation rises behind each child like a wave cresting out of the black northeast when the long darkness under sea roars up and bursts drumming death upon the wind whipped sand. I have seen this gathering sorrow from time long past loom upon Oedipus's children. Generation from generation takes the compulsive rage of the enemy god. 
So lately this last flower of Oedipus's line drank the sunlight, but now a passionate word and a handful of dust have closed up all its beauty. What mortal arrogance transcends the wrath of Zeus? Sleep cannot lull him, nor the effortless long months of the timeless gods, but he is young forever, and his house is the shining day of high Olympus. All that is and shall be, and all the past is his. No pride on earth is free of the curse of heaven. The straying dreams of men may bring them ghosts of joy, but as they drowse, the waking embers burn them, or they walk with fixed eyes as blind men walk, but the ancient wisdom speaks for, their, for our own time. Fate works most for woe with folly's fairest show. Man's little pleasure is the spring of sorrow. End of scene two. Shall we carry on or? I'm, uh, I don't know. We're halfway through. So We're halfway through the play. That was quick, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Maybe it's oh, page 20 of 41. Oh. Ah. So uh, not as long as I thought it would be. No. I, th I think it's best to, to stop. We stop at this point. That's fine, and we'll finish yeah. the rest up with a big climax and uh, and a fuller cast. And uh, we'll um, all... I I will not be able to be here in a fortnight. Uh, oh, my, okay, one of my brothers. Yeah, me too. So go you're ahead. also yep. uh, not uh, not here in a fortnight. Well, then in that case, we would try to make it next Sunday if we could. Uh, next is Sunday, possible? which is the. Uh, the 31st of the 31st 31st um, yeah that's fine by me i think okay. it works for me too yeah all right okay um, i think Just, uh, no. one week from now yeah <clears throat> that yeah that should wait the 31st yes, yes. That should be fine. All right, so we're locked in for the first. <laughs> Why have I got difficulty saying the 31st? I want to say 31st or something. I can never get it right. <laughs> Tongues and lips get tangled up with one another and it comes out wrong. Well, that, that was, was pretty great. good, actually. Hmm? I, I really enjoyed that. It was, yeah, it was fun. Did too. Yeah, it came alive. And yeah, you know, I just love the interplay between the king and 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 the girls. He's they're, they're such strong characters, and they um, 